Thank you, Olivier. Thank you for giving me the tour of uh, the premises here in Paris. I was very impressed, but I guess I don't have to tell you that. I visited your campus, the, the Google campus in Mountain View in California, and I have to say, uh, this one is just as nice, uh, just as nice, if not nicer, because it has this uh, Parisian cachet that they don't have in California. So kudos, guys. Um, it must be uh, super nice to, uh, to work here. Um, thank you for, for having me. Um, the truth might not exist, but I know that you guys at Google look very hard for it. So this should make for an interesting conversation. Bear with me a moment. I would like to take you on, on a journey uh, in the quest uh, for the elusive truth. So we start our journey in a, a small town uh, courtroom where a man is tried for the murder of his wife. According to the prosecutor, he killed her in cold blood at night in their home. Everything seems to be stacked against him. Uh, he had money problems. His rich wife threatened to divorce him. He had a mistress. And jurors have been discussing his fate for uh, three days now. And uh, in a matter of minutes, they will return to the courtroom with the verdict. And they will tell us at last what happened on that, fateful, on that fateful night. And the journalists, of course, are fretting. At last, we're, gonna, we're going to know the truth, they say. The truth. There could hardly be a less accurate word to describe what's about to unravel. For the man will initially uh, be sentenced to 30 years in jail, but will appeal the judgment and receive a much lesser sentence of five years the second time around, because the cold blood murder will have turned into an unfortunate accident. The cold hearted killer will have been demoted to a clumsy and temperamental husband. And in a matter of months, justice will have spoken two different truths. As hard as it is to admit, we'll never know for sure what happened on that night. Who should we believe? Should we believe the husband who swears that he pulled the trigger by mistake and claims that his wife used to make him beg for pocket money? Or should we, should we believe the prosecutor who invokes premeditation and portrays the victim as a humiliated woman? Even facts don't help us that much. The, finger, the man's fingerprints were found on the rifle's trigger, but it doesn't prove anything. It doesn't prove that he pulled it in cold, in cold blood. He could have stumbled. He could have, um, maybe he was provoked by his wife. We'll never know. Even the accused doesn't know anymore for reasons that we will discuss later. OK. so. At this point, we have established that journalists have a tendency to speak a little bit too casually about the truth. But this is hardly a scoop. Journalists are not alone. We all have a strange rapport with the truth. Simply put, we tend to confuse the truth with reality. Reality is what is. It is unique and can be expressed in purely factual manner. The shot was heard at 10.43 PM. The um, shooter was <coughs> within six feet of the victim. $1,000 were withdrawn from the uh, joint account on the day of the murder. That's reality. But truth? Truth doesn't exist. Or rather, there are an infinity of truth, depending on who you ask. If you believe the prosecutor, the man calmly took aim at his wife and put a bullet in her gut. But if you ask the defense attorney, his client was nervously clenching the trigger and the gun accidentally went off. Those affirmations posing as truth are nothing more than interpretations, the expressions of a subjectivity, or to be more provocative, just fictions. For 15 years, I've been trying in my novels to explore the reasons why we confuse fiction and truth. I will share with you some of my findings. And as you will see, they have a lot to do with the way our brain works. 
Let's start at the beginning. What separates man from animal? Some people will tell you that conscience does. Others, that it's language. For me, the answer is stories. The Homo sapiens has always produced and consumed an astounding quantities of stories, from the inhabitants of the caves of Lascaux to the clients of Netflix who binge on TV series. But luck has no place in evolution. If the frequency of a hereditary feature increases over time, it is because it improves the survival prospects of the species. Modern man being the result of millions of years of evolution, if we keep telling stories, we must derive benefits from it. Which benefits? I see two main ones. First, unlike animals, we have the ability to believe in intersubjective realities, such as nations, church, or money. As Yuval Harari explains in his book Sapiens, you will never take a banana from a monkey by telling him he will get 100 in the afterlife. We humans buy into those stories. They enable us to create larger and more complex societies than animals. Once you've reached the threshold of a few hundred individuals, you need glue to maintain the cohesion of the group. Stories are that glue. The second advantage of stories is of greater concern to us. To use a simple analogy, stories are a life simulator comparable in principle to the flight simulators on which pilots train. The anecdotes that pepper our conversations, the books we read, the movies we watch, prepare us to the situations we will encounter, sparing us costly mistakes and giving us the opportunity to live hundreds of lives at once. Before a teenager says, I love you for the first time, he or she has experienced um, hundreds of love stories by proxy. A soldier about to be deployed knows what to expect thanks to Saving Private Ryan and Full Metal Jacket. And all husbands know <coughs> the risk of an extramarital affair after they have seen fatal attraction. Because we consume so many stories, our brain has gotten used to connecting facts in that form. The following example comes from my novel, The Showrunners. Let's say you get onto a train and walk to your seat. The ticket inspector stands next to a passenger, a young backpacker with a three-day stubble beard. The young man is searching his pockets. You don't really pay attention to the scene until the next day when a friend of yours talks about the cost of fraud in public transportation. You then share with him the episode you witnessed. I intentionally use the word episode, for your brain will have organized this handful of facts in a cohesive story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. It will play something like this. The train inspector asked to see everybody's tickets. The backpacker didn't have one. The inspector wrote him up a ticket. The backpacker dug in his pockets for money. Now, please consider the number of implicit assumptions in this scenario. A man with a blue shirt and a cap is automatically a train inspector. A backpacker is a natural candidate for fraud. And anybody with hands, their hands in their pockets has to be searching for money. I'm sure you realize that this, this scene offers several other explanations. Maybe the train inspector had finished his service. He was headed to the restaurant. His son, who was traveling with him, was, handing, uh, was uh, giving him money to buy a sandwich. Or the inspector wrote up a ticket to an old lady who gave him a 100 euro banknote. And the, in, the, um, the inspector asked other passengers to help him with the change. Those would be possible scenarios. Of course, your scenario, the initial scenario, is by far the most likely. But that's exactly my point. From the moment that a likely scenario takes shape in your brain, it becomes a certainty. You're convinced you witnessed a train inspection. Scratch that. You witnessed a train inspection. A story has become a fact. Fiction has become reality. Just to be sure, you will have retained no other memory from this train ride. 
You walked up the aisle, a backpacker had no ticket. That's all you'll remember in a week or two. At the time, though, you had noticed a few other details. A few other details. Uh, a scarred man in uniform, uh, newspapers cramming uh, into um, the, the, the trash can. Those details vanished almost immediately, dispelled by other equally insignificant details. You forgot them because they weren't part of a story. Which leads us to another function of stories. They are mnemonic devices. Because it's easier to remember the sequence 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 than 5, 3, 2, 1, 4, our brain provides us with the illusion of an order by positing a chronology or causal links that do not exist. That's how a woman walking down the street at 8 a.m. holding the hand of a young girl with a backpack automatically becomes a mother taking a daughter to school. If you have taken one of those tests where you have to commit to memory as many ran uh, random objects as possible in a limited time, you know the secret is to wave the objects into a little story. That's exactly the same point. Recent discoveries in cognitive sciences have shown that we have two selves. The first one feels, the second one narrates and gives meaning to what we experience. The first one feels a stinging pain in your index finger. The second one says, oh, you just burned yourself by taking a dish out of the oven. Our memories are stories too. We tend to think that our brain stores memories like YouTube videos you can replay on demand. That would be nice, big market for you. <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth. Sounds, pictures, smells, emotions are, stores, are stored in different areas of your brain. When you're about to tell an anecdote, you summon all these memories and hastily craft a speech based on who you talk to and how long you have. The first times you tell the anecdote, the story, your story is still fluid. You experiment with words, you try variations. Over time, however, your story tends to solidify. You use the same adjectives over and over again. You make the jokes that you know will get you the laughs. The final version usually has little to do with the original one, which doesn't prevent you from being 100% sincere which doesn't prevent you from being 100% sincere when telling it. In The Showrunners, again, a character called Vargas ask, asks the hero Sleeve to share with him a personal memory. Sleeve, who lost his father to a brain tumor when he was 10, chooses to recount the last few weeks of the diseased. How his dad repainted the yard fence because he wanted to leave a clean house behind him. How every morning he would recite the first verses of the saga of Eric the Red when shaving to check that his memory was still intact. How he died on the gloomiest of days with all the lights in the, uh, in the house turned on despite the fact that it was noon. What a beautiful story, comments Vargas. Too bad it isn't true. And Sleeve takes offense, as you probably would, of Vargas' insinuations. It's the most painful episodes of his, uh, episode of his life. Why would he make any of those details up? But Vargas seems pretty adamant. He insists that Sleeve compare his memories with those of other members of his family. So Sleeve flies to Iceland to confront his mother. And much to his surprise, he discovers that Varga was right. Sure, Sleeve father's, Sleeve's father repainted the fence, but he did it two years, ago, uh, two years prior to being diagnosed with cancer. He didn't recite the saga of Eric the Red uh, in the morning. He didn't know one verse of poetry. And Sleeve's mother remembers that the sun was shining when she closed her husband's eyes. How can one die on such a beautiful day, she remembers thinking at the time. Sleeve and his mother have lived through the same scene, but they've each come away uh, with a different, uh, uh, different interpretation of that day. Once again, one reality has given birth to two different truths. So memories are stories. History, with a capital H, is a story too. Take the example of jazz. Encyclopedias will tell us that jazz is an African-American music, a mix of gospel, 
blues and of the songs that the uh, slaves used to hum in the plantations. Some sources also men mention the role played by the Jim Crow laws in the 1890s um, that increased segregation in the South and led African-American musicians to uh, regroup in small bands. At this stage of my presentation, though, I hope you realize that all this is pure speculation, a ludicrous attempt to connect independent facts. Just as we establish the difference between reality and truth, we need to understand the difference between the past and history. The past is what really happened. It is a fact that African-American slaves used to sing gospel at the end of the 19th century. It is a fact, too, that the Parliament of Louisiana passed a particular law in 1892. Yet, making those events milestones in the birth of a movement one will arbitrarily call jazz is telling a story, like gathering beads of various colors and sizes to make a bracelet. The truth does not exist. It is constantly being recreated. You know the saying, history is written by the victors? This is so accurate. Imagine what our children would be learning in school if Hitler had won World War II. It would read something like, the biggest benefit of the war was to, uh, is to have rid us of the Jews, a harmful and despicable race which used to control all the levers in international finance. No comment. If you start paying attention, you will notice that stories are everywhere, in manuals, in our memories, in religion, in current events, and even in science. This might, this might come as a surprise to you. In science, but of course. For centuries, the Earth was flat. Then it became round. Then it started to revolve around the sun. Every time the followers of the old theory called the new theory a hoax. And every time the disruptors thought they had revealed the laws of the universe and believed they would never be supplanted. Copernic was right to claim that the Earth revolves around the sun. But he wrongly assumed that the Earth followed a circular trajectory, while in fact it's elliptical. Copernic's mistakes were pointed out and rectified by Galileo and Newton, who then made other mistakes. It's the nature of the scientific process. Some of the theories our children learn in biology class today would have been deemed heretic 30 years ago. Which leads me to an obvious observation. Theories are stories too. Let's take the example of the Big Bang, the massive explosion that gave rise to the universe some 14 billion years ago. As I speak, there are about 100 theories about the Big Bang. Most of them come from phonies, but 10 or 12 emanate from highly distinguished astrophysicists. Since only one of these theories, at most, is, can be correct, it means that all the others are stories. I can't think of a better word to describe them. Stories. Stories crafted in good faith, but stories nonetheless. Besides, and I will push the envelope a little bit here, besides, even if one of these theories turned out to be true, I would personally still consider it a fable. If there are scientists in the room, and I bet there are today, they must think I'm crazy. Newton's law of uh, universal gravitation is not a fable. Yet, I persist. Granted, objects are attracted toward the center of the Earth. But when Newton attributes this phenomenon to a force equals gravity, I personally attribute it to the god Gravitor, who punishes man for Icarus' arrogance by pinning him to the ground. Moreover, I'm sure you know that Newton's theory, though it accurately predicts the movement of uh, asteroids, it's useless to predict the movement of very small particles, which means it is wrong. I'm not worried. Someone will improve on it. Every story displaces the previous one. There was a time when the universe was 6,000 years old. Then it was 100 million years. Then a billion. We currently stand at 14. Why should we stop there? So now you might wonder, I wonder that question all the time, especially um, since my job is to craft good stories uh, when I write books. What makes a story powerful? The stories we're talking about, they conform to the laws of Darwinism. Only the best stories survive. One day, one year, centuries for the, best, uh, for the most robust ones. As a rule of thumb, art is stronger than reality. 
Myths are more resistant than fables, and religions have a thicker skin than political ideals. But why is it that some stories withstand the test of time, while others are soon forgotten? In other words, what makes a story powerful? It is a subtle alchemy, the miraculous combination of eternal ingredients, mankind's biggest myth, of course, but also local cultures and the spirit of the times. Take, for instance, the movie Titanic and see how many timely themes it calls upon. The hubris of man, uh, true love, impossible love, class warfare, and so many others. Every country has their own prism through which they see the world. Americans, for instance, can't get enough of superhero stories. Think Batman, Spider-Man, X-Men, and you can name probably many, many others. This taste for superheroes has several roots. The Protestant belief in predestination, the myth of America as the promised land, and last but not least, a die-hard manichaeism. For many Americans, the world is fundamentally the place where the good and evil battle it out. As George W. Bush put it when he was trying to recruit allies before invading Iraq, you're either with us or against us. We, the French, have a fondness for have-nots and underprivileged characters. Mexicans are suckers for a good revenge story. The Japanese can resist a tale of heroic sacrifice. Once in a while, a story arises that transcends ethnical and religious divides and reminds us that we belong to a greater whole, a bit like the brother and sister who bury the hatchet the day when they step into a new school. St space travel or first contacts with alien civilizations are among the truly universal themes. So what we call the truth does not exist. Most of the time, it's only a shortcut, an interpretation, a story something is trying to sell us or one we're trying to sell to ourselves. You might wonder whether being aware of it has changed my behavior. It has. First, I don't fall as blindly for my own tales. Every time it's possible, I go back to the facts. I don't ignore my emotions, but I try to understand where they come from. In a way, I try to separate the feeling me from the narrating me. Very important to know which one is talking at the moment. Second, I can tell when the person speaking to me is making up their own truth. And surprisingly, this often triggers a rush of empathy towards them. Third, I'm wary of the simplistic messages of political leaders large corporations, intellectuals, and generally speaking, all the people who claim they hold the truth or even a fragment of the truth. And last, I support all attempts to rise above the very notion of truth. From that perspective, no project is more admirable to me than Wikipedia. I'm sure you know and use it as an encyclopedia, but Wikipedia is much more than that. It is, in my eyes, a tool to get closer to the truth. As you well know, any user can create and modify an article without any credentials and without any technical knowledge. <coughs> Some articles get modified dozens of times in a day. Let's take, for instance, the page of George W. Bush. Bush is, to use a euphemism, a controversial figure, a hero to some and a numbskull to others. Yet, his Wikipedia page is remarkably balanced. Why is that? Because by nature, Wikipedia doesn't tolerate extremism. Try to write, Bush is a moron, and your contribution will be overturned immediately. But write that one of the reasons Bush ignored the intelligence reports of his own administration is that he was surrounded by neoconservative uh, advisors who wanted to restore American military supremacy in the Middle East, and you will last a little bit longer. Because somewhere in Texas, a die-hard Republican will be going over your lines, looking in vain for a good reason to reject them. From the confrontation of your two brains, a new formulation will arise. It will not be the truth, since remember, the truth does not exist, 
but it will be a start, a first step towards the construction of a representation acceptable by all or nearly all. Thank you. first one and yes. hopefully that will inspire others. So with that premise, how do you live your day? <laughs> it seems like everything you're saying makes sense and yet we must carry on. You probably have your own beliefs. How do you make sense of your intellectual stance on the issue of truth, but then decisions you make about what you do with your day, what you make of current events? Um, I'm extremely skeptical of current events. I read several newspapers. I, the, the founding experience for me was when I moved to the US in 2002. It was um, at the time when, when Bush was building, his, uh, building up his uh, coalition to invade Iraq. And in France, when I used to live in France, I, I would read Le Figaro and Le Monde, and I thought I was pretty well informed. And I arrived in the US and I started to read the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and oh my God, this is a completely different story. It has nothing to do, this story has just nothing to do with the French one. And that, I think for me, it was a formative experience because I started to realize that it's all a perception. It has to do with, uh, with our country, with our religion, with our culture, with, uh, you know, they're Protestant, we're Catholic, we're, uh, uh, they practice religion, we don't. Uh, they, uh, you know, have a certain vision of the Middle East. We have a totally different one for historical reasons. And um, instead of being, uh, you know, you, you can get stuck there and say, okay, you know, there is no reason to do anything because I could read the papers from the other country and that would completely negate my, you know, the, the, the way I, uh, uh, my reasoning. But um, I think it's the, the opposite. You try to uh, go on with your day knowing that everything around you is competing stories. Stories competing for your attention, stories competing for your adhesion, um, and you don't have to be uh, a prisoner to that. You can see that with a bit of perspective, a bit of a grain of salt. And uh, I think that makes you a happier man, a freer man, that's, that's for sure. It might be a little bit challenging sometimes. You said, you know, you must have beliefs like anybody. Of course I have beliefs. I think the key is to know when your beliefs are beliefs or when your beliefs are certainties or truth. It's not the same thing. I don't mind having beliefs as long as I can keep telling they are beliefs and not everybody shares them. Thank you. Hello, thanks for the talk. Uh, are you not concerned that by preaching uh, about there not being uh, any truth uh, between big stories, uh, you could be discouraging people from learning? And for a pragmatic example, like, you, you, Let's take an example of nutrition. There will be people that will be saying, oh, for every paper that says that coffee is good for you, there's another that says that it's bad for you, so I give up. I will not educate myself because there's no consensus to be found. Even if there is a consensus, and they could have had their lives, they, they accept that there is some truth to be learned. Um, that's a very good question. Um, I have four kids, and... Um, when they, were, uh, when they were babies, there was the question of should we lie them down on, lying down on the back or lying down on the belly, you know? And this is funny because you read a book that was written 20 years ago, it was one way, and now it's the opposite. And like, oh my God, you could be endangering your kids if you lie down on the belly. But that's what our parents have done. Oh yes, but it was, you know, they were taking such risks, they didn't know it at the time, but you know. And, and what's funny is that 10 years down the road, it's going to be the, op the opposite. In, uh, in some instances, on some you know, particular facts, there seems to be so much flip-flopping that I, I, I can't fathom how people can still be serious about it. Uh, I think if I was a pediatrician, I, was, I would tell my patients, you know, yes, right now we say that you, know, you should lie down on the back, but honestly, we don't have a clue. You know, this could change. So, if you have to choose, 
choose the back, mm, you know, <laughs> maybe a 60% chance. I would be honest about it, but I, I think I would lose a ton of patience. Um, it's, it's not the right way to do. Our system, in, in a way, is, is geared toward more conviction, more beliefs, people affirming their beliefs even more, and I would say probably uh, the less sure they are about their beliefs, the more they affirm them. And that's something that, to me, that's extremely worrisome. Um, so I would tell my, what I tell my kids today, for instance, about nutrition or about uh, other subjects, say, uh, is um, um, study, get, get, your, get your facts together, try to develop an opinion, confront your opinion with others, Remember, it's an opinion. Remember, it's a way of articulating facts. For, it's, it's, it's a way of, uh, I mean, it's the, um, the image that I used uh, earlier in the talk when I said it's about picking uh, beads from various sizes and colors and to make up a bracelet. Or it's you have different points. It's, you think you have the one path that unites them all and you think that this is the truth. Well, guess what? There are many ways to unite all those paths. You, know, you could be going like this. It would be a co completely different idea, but it wouldn't be less, um, you know, less uh, structured um, an opinion. So, um, no, it's still possible to live with, uh, with, uh, with this belief that stories are everywhere. <laughs> So I had an anecdote uh, to start. Back uh, in, I think, 2005, I was living in Asia at the time. And uh, I went to the island of Sumatra in Indonesia. And at the time, that island suffered over two years, I think, both a massive earthquake and a tsunami. Uh -huh. Two natural disasters of quite big proportions. And um, a local newspaper, uh, reported a story that um, uh, a certain party of, uh, I would say, fundamentalist Islamic people were explaining to the population that uh, the reason why these uh, disasters happened was because they had been bad Muslims and they hadn't really uh, followed the, uh, the rules of the religion. And to my absolute huge surprise, uh, I heard that these, uh, this political party was actually gaining a lot of traction, were actually um, showing up as likely to win the next elections. So my question to you would be this. This is obviously a story, and not the one that I would have um, you know, invited, in, invented for myself, learning that there had been two disasters in a row. I would not have attributed that to a god. Um, but do you reckon that do you think that some stories have a higher value than others, are better than others? Of course. Do you think it's possible to yeah, create a hierarchy? Of course, of course. If it were not, I guess I wouldn't be doing this job. I wouldn't have been uh, you know, an entrepreneur before. Um, I would be a prophet or I would be uh, you know, evangelizing uh, these very credulous people. Um, of course, there is a, the, a hierarchy. Um, I have the utmost respect for the scientific process, for the scientific profession. Um, we, we need people to keep working on the edge of the universe. We need people to keep uh, uh, working on the trajectory of asteroids. Um, we need that. They, they give us invaluable information. And that information, once we have it, we cannot forget it. We cannot, we cannot do, we cannot pretend that it doesn't exist. So um, everything we know about you know, climatology, for instance, tell us that there is a very, very, very low probability that those two uh, catastrophes that you uh, mentioned were caused by the behavior of some uh, Muslim people somewhere in Sumatra. Um, so I attach a very, very, very low proportion to that, um, to that um, probability, yet, what I think is crucial is to know that some people pin a pretty high probability to that scenario. And we live with those people. We share the same world. Um, and it can be a bit scary sometimes, but it's not something that you can afford to forget. Okay. 
Hi. Uh, sorry, so I think we moved to the U.S. at the same time. Yeah. Really? The, the, the war made, and it, to have a French accent was a horrible time, to have a French accent <laughs> in New York or Miami. Yeah. Uh, you were saying that, uh, we, so my question is, what worries you? Because we are in a, and I agree with you, but what worries you? Because we are in a society that we have all more access to information, so we can check different stories and bring our own uh, truth, but also everybody has an opinion, so even anybody can do a YouTube video and explain dumb stuff and have a follow-up. So my question is, what worries you, worries you, and what do you think will be a solution on top of better education, etc.? Because you say it worries you that we live in this world right now. Um. In, from the top of my head, intolerance is, is the one thing that worries me the most. Uh, it's the reason of my um, why I commit so much um, for um, Wikipedia. Uh, I've been a, a strong supporter of Wikipedia for, for years now. I think they do an excellent job and a very important job at disseminating information and disseminating information that has manage to build a consensus. Um, and that, to me, is absolutely crucial. And it's not a, a coincidence if Wikipedia is banned in China, is banned in Turkey, uh, is banned, was sometimes banned in France, would you believe it? Uh, certain art, uh, articles were blocked uh, in France, which is no longer possible. Um, Wikipedia has changed the way they operate. Now you have to ban the entire uh, site. You cannot ban only a selected um, few articles. So intolerance obviously um, scares me. Um, and intolerance, I think, what scares me is people, you know, what they call the useful idiots or the, the, the people who... Um, who, who think they know, they think they are in control, and they should be the one admitting that they know very, very little. Citizens who don't inform themselves, for instance, who don't do their job. I think citizen is a job. Citizen is not a right. Uh, well, it is obviously a right, but it, is, it comes with duties and responsibilities. Um, going to vote without doing your homework, to me, is a betrayal of the democratic pact. Um, and it is a betrayal that many, many people are guilty of um, today. So that's, that worries me. First of all, um, I, I never realized that uh, storytelling was so pervasive. Um, maybe a lot of you are, are, are similar to me, but I have a, I have a friend that, that, a long time friend that we've known for several years, and who's consistently tell stories. Uh, um, we've stuck th with him uh, throughout, you know, a lot of people in the medium, they, they, they just kind of find it kind of comical. Um, we, we, we call it giving him an 80% discount because we know that there's probably, his story started with a fact somewhere, but then he added 80 to 90% uh, of a story on top of it. Um, my question is, because we have discussions with, with, uh, amongst friends about should we try to intervene and give <laughs> him some help? Because it affects his, uh, it affects his like, personal life. I mean, most people are, like, uh, are not attracted to a person where they obviously are you know, telling stories. Uh, most of them and there are obvious stories uh, all, all the time. Or, sh or should we just leave it because his ego is now all caught up and he, he believes his own mm -hmm. stories? So his ego is all caught up in this, in the in the stories that he's fabricated uh, on this fictional life, essentially. So it's it's a complex issue. I just wanted to see if you have. How old is he? He's uh, in his mid forties. My my last book, the ones that the, the one that some of you have um, in front of them, uh, Cherbus et moi, is about a pathological imposter, and his relationship with a psychiatrist and the way this uh, relationship develops over the years, over the decades even. Um, I've, I've documented myself quite a bit for um, that book. I've read a lot about pathological liars and imposters. My experience, I mean, the, the takeaway from my readings is that you won't change him. He's, t he's too old. Yeah. He's too old. See, if someone maybe at 
you know, attracted his attention uh, earlier and had showed him exactly where he had derailed and, and the impact and the damage it could do to his uh, entourage. Maybe you, know, you would have been able to put him uh, back on track, but I don't really believe that. Even in his, in, his, in his 20s, it would have been difficult. In his 40s, it's probably a lost cause. Yeah, I can share the share opinion as well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question over here. Yes. Then you can come back to me after. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. So it was just about democracy, which was a word as uh, mm. said uh, before. So democracy writes their own stories, and they have very hard time uh, against the stories by extremism. And I just want to, to know what you think about that. I'm sorry, what I think about what? About this, I think democracies has a hard time to write compelling stories. Yes. Compared to the stories by made by the extremism. I I I okay. I get the 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 question. I'm not really sure about that. Like probably the the best story about democracy is the American story. Uh, they did a pretty good job. They did a very, very good job. The house upon the hill a, and the, the promised land and the constitution, the founding fathers, all that wisdom pouring into the country, um, a text that has withstood the test of time, uh, the, 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 the supreme um, the, the justices that uh, you know, can tell the law once in a while uh, when need be, the president, the checks and balances, um, it's a very, very good story. I live there and I'm, you know, I, I based in that story every day. And I have to say, as a storyteller, every day I think, ma, they're pretty good. <laughs> they're pretty good. Um, the, yes, I mean, the, 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 um, the fascist regimes, for instance, uh, have different stories and, and can have compelling stories if you're in the right uh, camp. Uh, if you're not one of the Jews or uh, you know uh, homosexuals, uh, I guess you might like that story. Some people don't. Um, but those stories, honestly, I'm not sure that that Good. I mean, when you think about uh, National Socialism uh, lasted for only 10 years, 12 years. Uh, communism is almost, for, uh, well, I won't say forgotten, but I mean, except for Venezuela um, and I won't say China, but, uh, um, you know, it, so it has disappeared from, from almost uh, everywhere in the world. Um, it's what I was trying to say, religions usually last much longer than political ideals. Political ideas are much more, um, um, pass much more quickly than we think. Thank yes. you for sharing your story about truth and its non-existence. Uh, uh, I also uh, admire Wikipedia a lot. and. You cited it as a place that helps people, let's say, move to better stories, mm -hmm. let's say, or stories yes. that are more useful. Or can... So Wikipedia is built on a governance, which is really effective. People can bring ideas, they yes. can bring credibility and expertise, and there's a whole bunch of mechanisms that help the process. Where that sort of governance seems to be important to allow stories to get better and to be explored amongst people, where are the other places uh, in which governance exists that you admire and respect in, of that nature, whether it's in the pursuit of better stories or better institutions? Um, first, a side note, on Wikipedia, the governance is much uh, lighter than you think. Like, for instance, the credibility of the person who writes is never taken into account. And you would think, oh my god, that's how you end up having so poor pages. But that's quite the opposite. People who don't feel you know, empowered to write about the subject simply don't. Um, and I can tell you on the other end, I've tried to rectify something on my Wikipedia page. I was banned from it. You know, <laughs> you, you would think that you know best. No, you don't. You know? So, because maybe, Mr. Bellow, you have a problem with the truth, you know? Maybe your memories, your memories were, uh, your, were um, uh, a story as well. Um, so, I'm, I'm not sure I really see that type of governance anywhere else or I admire it anywhere else. What I see is that large companies like yours 
are trying at the moment to get to something like that. I mean, Facebook is trying very hard I mean, with their tens of thousands of uh, fact checkers and uh, um, and Google, you have a lot of processes in in place, the the the, um, the right to be forgotten and 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 what you can you know um, mention. You can report bad pages, or you can report you know every uh, every time you suspect a, a scam of or an operation to um, increase the uh, the search engine ranking of a, of a page. You can alert Google to it. I think that's pretty powerful. It's only uh, the beginning, though. It, and your company, probably among uh, uh, all the others, probably has the biggest responsibility. I mean, if if, if I remind correctly, the goal of Google was to uh, uh, organize uh, all the information around the world. Wow, that's a tall order. Uh, you better get it right yeah, for our it. for our sake. Yeah. It's not just that. It's also to make it universally useful and accessible. So, yes. And that question of universally useful and accessible is obviously a question which involves multiple perspectives. Yes, exactly. And I'm, I'm not, you know, for instance, there is this uh, debate right now about uh, should Google go back to China, for instance, uh, and, and tailor the search engine to the, to the needs of the Chinese government. Um, I follow this, de this debate and I find it fascinating, to be honest, because I don't have the answer to that. There is a part of me who says, no, of course, no, don't go to China. You know, they ban Wikipedia. Why would Google go and, and, and you know, get in bed with the, the, the Chinese leaders? And at the same time, I have to think, you know, a 99 percent search engine that would do 99 percent of what Google does in the rest of the world would be a nice service to the Chinese people and, and, and would accommodate their, like you said, their, their vision of the world, which is not the same as ours, and, and ours is not, is not better. So it's the, typically the type of subjects where I am you know, divided and I, and I you know, refrain from uh, the temptation of judging too quickly. Thank you. Uh, two more questions, please. Over there. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm curious in the idea of bringing this consensus to the political area mm -hmm. um, to explain my point and to ask your opinion. Um, some democracies that try democracy by consensus, mm -hmm. it brought some weaknesses to them because it takes time and effort and it's easier to be quick and not make, not make efforts. Mm -hmm. Do you have an opinion on that? Or do you not, not really. It would be a stretch to say that I have an opinion on that. I lived in Japan for a while. I lived in Japan for a year and a half in the 90s. And I was extremely impressed by uh, their, governing, their governing by consensus. It was extremely impressive the way they were able to raise the age of uh, retirement at the time uh, without any dissent, without anybody taking to the streets. Um, it was a lesson to me in um, you know, reason and democracy. At the same time, I know it comes with pretty uh, with plenty of uh, of um, inconvenience. Like you said, the democratic process in Japan is slow. Uh, political uh, parties and politicians are corrupted um, and can be easily bought, from what I hear. Um, so I I won't make it an example, but um, no, I, I don't have a firm opinion on that. Thanks. Last question. One last question. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I was curious, what's your view on artificial intelligence and, mm -hmm. and the evolution of that technology um, based on the fact you know, that more and more will be using data uh, provided or information provided by machines as the truth somehow? I'm, I'm so interested by artificial intelligence that I wrote a whole novel about it. It's called ADA. ADA, it's the name of an artificial intelligence developed in the Silicon Valley, not far from Mountain View. Uh, in Mountain View, actually, I think. No, in Stanford. Um, or, and that gets stolen. Uh, and so the question is, uh, the, the program gets stolen, disappears from the hard drive. And the question is, now we have this you know, program uh, out in the open. What 
will anyone do with it, what will it do with itself. So, um, My role as a writer to, is not to provide answers, I think is to ask the questions in an elegant manner. So I think that's what I, that's what I try to do in, uh, in ADA, explore all the possibilities um, offered by artificial intelligence, and there are many, but of course reminding uh, you know, the reader of all the risks that, um, that go with it. And there is no real conclusion at the end of the book. I think uh, any conclusion would have been a, um, an usurpation of my uh, you know, uh, powers and uh, privileges as a writer. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so I think it's the end. Okay. Thank you very much, Antoine. <laughs> Merci. Merci.